are having a few technical difficulties. If you saw our sound man just fly by the thing, you know, one thing about not having anybody here is that the sound guy can be running around and you guys don't know it until he runs right in front of the camera. It was the funniest thing. So I'm watching, I try to watch the video and respond to people. So David's in a very, you know, it's a worshipful song, Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. And people, you can just feel people entering in and then the sound guy. Just, just, he just, he just penguins right across the screen. Just whoop. So anyway, Randy, we love you. Thank you for wrestling this morning. He early on was wrestling. And here's the thing. The reason that it's difficult is we're adding new features for our services. So, so in just a few weeks, the last Sunday of this month, we're going to open up the nine o'clock service. But we're also, because we know we can't seat everybody in here, we're also going to have speakers outside. So Randy's been hooking that up. We have audio capability for cars in the parking lot. So if you pulled in next Sunday in the parking lot, you could sit there and listen to us live. By the way, anytime you're watching, if you want to come by after the service and say hi, uh, we're out there not long after the service ends, and you can say hi just, just six feet, six feet, stay away, right? And, uh, but anyway, we're uh, going through a series that we got years ago from this book by Max Lucado called You'll Get Through This. And so I like to start with reading the little quote from his book. People said this is so powerful to them, and it says this. You'll get through this. It won't be painless. It won't be quick. But God will use this mess for good. Don't be foolish or naive, but don't despair either. With God's help, you'll get through this. So it's a great book. You can buy it online, I'm sure. There's probably an audio version now with Max Lucado reading it. It's a great book. So today we're going to talk about what to do when temptation arrives. And years ago, I think I just called this sermon temptation. I actually tweaked all the messages that we did years ago in this series, especially with the things that are going on. And here, here's what we're going to talk about today. Giving in to temptation, and, and when we miss the mark, the word sin literally is the idea of an archer who misses the mark. It's, a, it's an idea that you don't quite make it. And the truth is, for all of us, the Bible says, all have sinned and fallen short. And that's what that word means. It's the idea that you can't measure up to God's standard. No matter how hard we try, no matter how many good works you do, you can't make it to the good place on your own. You can't make it to the good place based on works. It doesn't matter if you are the best person in the world. Your best works, Paul says, are filthy rags. And so the truth is we all fall sometimes. We all struggle. And here's what's interesting. Sometimes when we think we're doing well, we are setting ourselves up for failure, and we have to be careful. And giving in to temptation and sin, sometimes we think of as these huge things, these huge sins. You know, you know a congressman who, who gets caught with somebody or, or somebody cheating on their spouse. And, and trust me, those are horrible sins. But the truth is, we tend to make those big choices because of the small choices we make every day. And, and the choices, listen, every day, when we choose to be self-centered, when we choose to be selfish and look towards our own needs and only look towards our... Now, there's nothing wrong with taking care of yourself. But when we begin to ignore anybody else's needs and only look at ourselves, what we're doing is we become very selfish. Now, let me give you an example uh, because here's what I think. I think Joseph, the reason he was able to overcome this huge temptation of Potiphar's wife, which we're going to talk about in a minute, was because he made good choices every day. Years ago, there was a kid in our neighborhood named Todd Vernon. And we would go down, my brother and I would go down to his house, and Todd had the best basketball in the neighborhood. Todd had the leather basketball. I mean, he also had the best matchbox cars. He was one of these kids that actually kept his matchbox cars in the holders. We didn't know what that's like. We had them thrown in a basket, but he actually had separate car containers that you opened that smelled like new plastic. I mean, it was unbelievable. But anyway, we would, that was just a random ADD moment. Anyway, so we would go to Todd's house and we would play basketball. <laughs> there is no bounce on this stage at all. Oh, this ball's flat. Uh, but anyway, so, so we would go to Todd's house and we would play basketball. And, and the truth is, so we would start to play, and this happened many times. We'd be playing, and Todd, we would, you know, we would block Todd, and he would yell foul. Or Todd would foul us, and we would yell foul. 
and Todd would get mad, and he would look at us, and he would say, fine, I'm not playing with you anymore, and he would take his ball, walk into his house, and close the garage door. He, he literally took his ball and went home. Now, let me tell you how that applies to Christians all the time. If you begin to look for ways to bless other people, if you begin to look for ways to be unselfish, to use your gifts to help other people, can I tell you that there's times that you're going to get hurt? When you use your gifts to bless somebody, when you go out of your way to do something for somebody, you know, the old saying says, you, you know, no good deed goes unpunished. And sometimes when you go to help somebody and you offer them your best, it's not going to be good enough. They're not going to appreciate it. But that's when the choice comes in. Who am I serving? See, Joseph in this story knew he was not serving Potiphar, and he wasn't serving Potiphar's wife. Who was he serving? He was serving God. When you have a gift, and you get hurt, and you quit using your gifts to bless others, that is selfishness. That is self-centeredness. Now, I'm not talking about spending your all until you die. I'm talk that's not balance. But if you have refused anymore to hang around Christians or to be with them or to spend time with other believers or to use your gifts to be a blessing to other people, just like our friend in elementary school, you're taking your ball and going home and then wonder why you've lost your joy. Wonder why you've lost your peace. Wonder why when you, a big temptation comes your way, you easily fall into it. It's because when you move into selfishness and self-centeredness, it makes it so easy to slip into bigger sins. And I think when we look at this passage that we're going to look at today, I want to encourage you to think about the big picture. Genesis 39 is where we're going to be. Number one, temptation arrives unexpectedly. Realize <clears throat> that nobody gives you a warning. They don't send you a three-day notice, get your life straight, because temptation's coming. The truth is, every day, you and I make choices about temptation. So here's what it says in Genesis 39, 6 through 10. So Potiphar, who now was his boss, Potiphar, uh, remember Joseph was dragged in to Egypt. He was taken from his family. They sold him. His brothers sold him and then faked his death. Those are some awesome brothers. Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now, Joseph was well-built and handsome. I don't think I need to explain that to you. Maybe you think of Brad Pitt or The Rock that way. One of those people sitting in this room virtually today with us. He was well-built and handsome, and then it continues... After a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, Come to bed with me. But he refused. Now, time out. Joseph has been sold by his brothers. Many people would think at that point they were abandoned by God. By the way, I believe that Joseph has already forgiven his brothers. Because what I know about unforgiveness is when you can't forgive somebody... You tend to focus on that, and you would never be in charge of a household. You'd have the wrong attitude all the time. You'd be negative. You'd be focused on what had happened to you, and Joseph was focused on what was happening now. So when Potiphar's wife tempted him, listen to what he says. With me in charge, my master doesn't concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. By the way, Joseph didn't know it, but he was being prepared for his future job. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you're his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and listen to who he knows he's working for and sin against God? How can I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, the continuation of temptation just kept coming and coming. He refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. Why? Because he knew who he really worked for. So he was ready for the temptation. See, when we begin to focus on pleasure, when we begin to focus on our own needs all the time. Now listen, you've got to eat. 
You've got to sleep. You've got to have balance. But we are stewards of what God's given us. We work for him. And so we need to look at our lives and say, God, my life is yours. What do you want me to do? And when we have that attitude, we tend to make better choices. I'm not saying we will never fall. I'm not saying we will never fail. But Joseph could stand in temptation because he knew. When the suddenly came, he knew who God was. I, I want to read some suddenlies in life that have happened. Here's some actual insurance claim statements from people. The car in front hit the pedestrian, but he got up. So I hit him again. The other car collided with mine without giving me warning of its intention. I collided with a stationary truck coming the other way. A pedestrian hit me and, I, and went under my car. The guy was all over the road. I had to swerve a number of times before I hit him. The pedestrian had no idea which way to run as I ran him over. I saw a slow-moving, sad-faced old gentleman as he bounced off the roof of my car. The accident was caused by me waving to the man I hit last week. When I saw I could not avoid a collision, I stepped on the gas and crashed into the other car. And then last but not least, the pedestrian ran for the pavement, but I got him. These are actual insurance statements. Listen, nobody plans a car accident. Nobody plans on something coming at you. Temptation is the same way. You don't plan on it happening, but all of a sudden you're tempted and you don't expect it. Listen to this verse in 1 Peter 5, 8, and 9. Be alert and of sober mind. That literally means be awake. Wake up. Pay attention. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He's looking. Who's weak? Who's hurting? A lion will grab the weakest thing first. He's looking. If you're struggling, by the way, also if you're serving God, that's somebody he'll attack. If you don't do anything, yeah, he's going to leave you alone. Maybe you're not under pressure because you're not doing anything. Resist him. And then it says, standing firm in the faith because you know the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. I just saw that Twyla's watching. It's good to have you watching, Twyla. Can't wait till we can see your face again here. So when it says here, standing firm in the faith, it's this idea of what is your foundation? Is your foundation built on God's word and on a relationship with God, or is it just whatever comes to you, whatever you feel like? And if we're all honest, most of our life is built just on the habits we have, the things that we do, and we just do what we've always done, but we're not alert. When's the last time you really thought about your schedule? When's the last time as you went through your day, you said, God, help me to pay attention to other people, to be a blessing everywhere I go? See, we think about ourselves an awful lot and our own perspectives and our own ways of looking at things, but Joseph looked at life through the filter of, what does God want me to do? You know, Tim Tebow had it right. What would Jesus do, right? He wasn't the only one that said that. He was not the first one to say that. But the truth is for us, what would Jesus do if he was where you were at today? Who would he call and encourage? Who would he go out of his way to send an email to? Who would he text? Who would he maybe even write, you ready for this? Maybe even write a handwritten letter to. I got to be a part of a group that wrote handwritten letters to go to nursing homes a couple of weeks ago. Handwritten. If you've seen my writing, you know it's probably not a good idea. So here's what I want you to do first. Remind yourself who you serve. If you're struggling with temptation, remind yourself of who you serve. And I'd be honest with you, we need to do that every day because the truth is there's a tendency for all of us to get frustrated and hang on to our stuff. Hang on to the way we've always done things, our attitudes, our actions. Look for pleasure, avoid pain, and say, God, I'm just going to do what makes me feel good. And God says, no, no, no. I want you to serve others. I want you to bless others. That selfishness, that self-centeredness, I believe so often is what leads us into deeper temptation. We didn't just fall the one time. We began a process of selfishness 
and self-centeredness. So temptation arrives unexpectedly. Number two, sin will whisper no fear and then yells failure. I love this part of the story because in this part of the story, she's like, it's no big deal. Come on, it's no big deal. Come on. And then she loudly accuses him of what he didn't do. Now, would she have done that anyway? Maybe. She, she might have wanted to, to get him in bed and then yell about it and get rid of him. By the way, most theologians think that Potiphar didn't really believe her. We're going to see in the story in a minute, Potiphar put him in jail. Potiphar could have had him killed if he really believed what she said. And so I think he was torn. I remember years ago, I was sitting in a large assembly in junior high. And the guy asked this question. This will tell you how long ago it was. He said, who do you think killed J.R.? And now in junior high, nobody yells out except for an ADD person. Now you have to realize I had just come from a class with a, a teacher named Mr. Houston. His name was spelled almost like Houston, but his name was Houston. And in his class, on his wall, he had posters everywhere of J.R. Ewing. So as an ADD kid, I yelled out, Mr. Houston! <laughs> Thankfully, the guy on stage did not hear me. I instantly realized everyone else was quiet, and I just yelled out like a dork. So I thought, okay, I got away with it. I got away with blurting. But then the speaker looked at me and said, what did you just say? And I said, no, 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 it's okay. No, 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 what did you just say? No, 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 it's okay. What did you just say? Mr. Houston, everyone groaned. My teacher came over and got me and said, that's not funny, come sit with me. The guy just kind of rolled his eyes. I remember sitting there and all of a sudden all I could hear was failure, idiot, what have you done? Listen, when you're tempted, just like I was tempted to yell out something I thought was funny, I still think it's pretty funny. Nobody else did. It's like your jokes, Dave. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Dave, I love your jokes. By the way, somebody said if Brian wasn't here today, we would be riceless. Okay? So that was online. That was very good. So, so but here's the deal. Have you ever been there where you did something dumb and you didn't think it was going to be a big deal and then suddenly... It was like, oh, that was the dumbest thing you ever did. And it could be something simple. It could be that you go on a diet and you decide, I'm not going to eat any more cookies. And then your brain says, the cookie's no big deal. One cookie won't hurt. One cookie won't hurt. One cookie won't hurt. And then you eat a sleeve of cookies. And then for the next three days, all you hear is, you're such an idiot. You have no willpower. All the things the enemy does. Listen to this. One day, Joseph went to the house, Genesis 39, 11 to attend his duties, and none of the household servants was inside. She caught him by his cloak and said, come to bed with me, but he left his cloak. By the way, he was trying to avoid her the whole time. It says that there. She caught him by his cloak and said, come to bed with me. He left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. When she saw he had left her cloak in her hand and had run out of the house, she called her household servants. Look, this Hebrew has been brought to make sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. By the way, she may have done that anyway. There was no pregnancy test back then. So she may have just said, oh, he, 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 he did that. I didn't want him to do that. I mean, he could have just as easily. And this is exactly what sin does. This temptation is not a big deal. Give in. Give in to that little indiscretion. Watch that show. Hang out with that person. Oh, it doesn't matter if you're married and go eat alone with a woman in a restaurant and talk about your spouse. Oh, boy. But the next thing you know. By the way, I've heard that story over and over and over again. It's one of the easiest temptations to get into because it seems like a good thing, but there's something in our heart that knows, you know, I probably shouldn't be spending time with somebody from the opposite sex alone when I'm married talking about my spouse. That happens over and over and over. Rodney said, uh, I talked to Rodney a few years ago and he was telling me about his dad and how his dad used to go to AA and they had a saying in AA that the times you had to be careful of. And you had to be careful when, and he said it spells halt, H-A-L-T. Here's times you need to be careful of. When you're hungry, the Snickers commercial is accurate. When you are hungry, you tend to make bad decisions. By the way, they've done studies that many people get in fights, families get in fights right before dinner time. 
if you think about it, a lot of that has to do with not just mental, not just actual thing, but it has to do with physical, how we're feeling. We're hungry. Our blood sugar's low. We're grumpy. And so we fight right then. And then when you're angry, if you're struggling with anger, that goes back to unforgiveness. Joseph, I believe, forgave his brothers. That's the reason he could move forward. Angry people make bad decisions. Halt. H-A-L. When you're lonely. When you're lonely, you tend to give anything. And listen, a third of married people say that they feel totally alone. One third. So if you're alone, you're not alone. If you feel alone, you're not alone in feeling alone. People feel alone. That's not an excuse to give in. Be very careful when you feel alone. You tend to make bad decisions and you justify it by saying, I just needed an out. And then finally, when you're tired. When you're tired, you do dumb things. That's why my dad used to say to me, now, Brookins, Eric, remember when you go out, nothing good happens after midnight. And as a teenager, can I tell you something? Nothing good happened after midnight. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 to 13 says this. So if you are, think you are standing firm, listen to this. If you think you got your act together, if you think, 1 Corinthians 10, 12 and 13. If you think you are standing firm, be careful that you do not fall. And then it says this, no temptation has seized you what is common to man. God is faithful. He won't let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you're tempted, what do they do? He'll provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Can I tell you the truth, though? When it says provide a way out, it means a way to walk out. So you have to take responsibility for walking out of that temptation. You, you can't sit there with the cookies on the table going, God, give me discipline. Boy, those look good. Delicious. I'm glad those Girl Scouts came by. By the way, I know something about temptation. If you made a commitment today to not eat Girl Scouts cookies, when you get home, there'll be 12 Girl Scouts giving away Girl Scout cookies, whatever your favorite kind is. That's how temptation works. It seems like the very thing we're fighting is the very thing we're attacked by. So here's your second encouragement. Focus on the final outcome of temptation. Look at the big picture. Joseph looked at the big picture. He knew I work for God, and he knew the outcome of what would happen if he did that sin. And like I said, many theologians think that Potiphar did not fully believe his wife, and that's the reason he put him in jail instead of killing him. If Joseph had given in, we would not be reading about Joseph today. I believe that Joseph, because he did what's right, even though he suffered for doing what's right. He did what's right, even though it seemed like he was persecuted at every turn. He even forgave those who hurt him. How do I know that? Because the next place he goes. But Listen, if I was Joseph, I would have given up after that second attack. Number three, when you are hurting, God provides people. All of us have been hurt. If you've lived long enough, you've been hurt. And you can choose to not forgive the people who hurt you. By the way, it's good to see you, honey, sitting with Josh and Mike in church. That's really good. My wife is sitting between Mike and Josh's face next to Carlos. It's good to see all of you together, all the Archibalds there, your brothers on that row too. It's good to see you guys. This morning. I'm so weird. In Genesis 39, 19, listen to this. So unforgiveness, we all can, can have something that we can't forget. Forgiveness does not mean you justify what a person did. Forgiveness does not mean that you say it was okay, but forgiveness means you no longer hold it against them. You don't expect them to pay it back any longer. When his master heard the story, his wife said, this is how your slave treated me, he burned with anger. Joseph's master took him, put him in prison, the place, listen, where the king's prisoners we're confined. See, once again, this woman meant this for evil, but God used it for good. How do I know? Because Joseph was going to be second in charge, and he could not get to where he needed to be without his brother selling him and without him getting in prison with royal prisoners. That's how he met the butler and the baker who come into our story a little bit later. And then it says this, listen to this. But while Joseph was there in the prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness. And listen, granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. I believe this is more than the warden promoting him. 
Because the warden knows about Joseph. How do I know that? Because he knows who to put with who. He knows what Joseph has the ability to do. He knows what Joseph's strengths are. He is on Joseph's side. We all need people like that when we're struggling. If you're struggling with unforgiveness, you need somebody to talk to. You don't need 500 people to call. If you call everybody, I always say, you know, there's a, there's a balance in life. If you tell everybody all your problems, you're crazy. If you tell nobody any of your problems, you're crazy. So somewhere in between those, we need a few good friends. Listen to what it says here in James 5.16. Therefore, confess your sins to each other. Miss the mark, the times you don't measure up. By the way, it doesn't say to your pastor. There's nothing wrong with talking to your pastor about your struggles, but it doesn't say pastor or elder or religious leader here. It says to each other. Basically, have a safe friend you can talk to. Confess your sins to each other, and then it says pray for each other. Why? So you may be healed. Healed from what? Healed from hurt. Healed from failure. Healed from not only not forgiving others, but hey, guess what? Sometimes we don't forgive ourselves. Have you blown it and messed up, and you still look back and you go, oh. You have to forgive you. And by the way, when you do something really bad, you have to forgive yourself over and over. And when somebody else does something really bad, you have to forgive them over and over. It's not one time. And then it says, pray for each other, you may be healed. And then it says, the prayer of a righteous man is fat, powerful and effective. So finally today, share your struggles with a few others. Listen, I want you to be able to take the ball, the gifts God's given you, and just like Joseph, realize this is not mine. The things I know how to do, the gifts that I have, the life that I've been given was given to me by God. And if we're going to avoid and resist temptation, the first step is to recognize, God, my life's yours. Because temptations flow out of selfishness and self-centeredness. And when we say, God, just like Joseph, I serve you. It'll change our perspective. It'll change our future. It'll change your impact on other people. If you're watching today online and you want to talk about this, you feel free to send me an email, send me a text. If you're watching on Facebook Live, you can send me a message on Facebook. And I'd love to talk to you, interact with you about what's going on. Maybe I can help you. Maybe you have a question about what we talked about today. Maybe you're sitting there and you know about Jesus, but you've never surrendered your life to him. You know that Jesus died on a cross and rose again. You know that he wants you to put him in charge of your life, and you've called yourself a Christian, but the truth is you've never surrendered your life to him. If you want to do that today, send me a note. Give me a call. Call the office. I'd love to talk to you about what it means to give your life to Christ, and give you some material to help you grow in Him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, thank you for each one that's watching today, wherever they are, whether they're watching today or even in the future, I pray that they have been led to this sermon because of something in their life, and that, Father, even right now, this sermon, just like this ball, would just be an offering to you. And Lord, I pray it's used to bless people, encourage people, inspire people. Use us, Lord, however you want, because we serve you in the good times and the bad times. And I pray too, Father, that you would, for those who've been hurt, who are afraid to have a few good friends, that you would provide friends to give them favor, that they could have somebody to confess to, to encourage, to pray for. May we be that for other people. Lord, we thank you for the example of Joseph in this time today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching this morning. 